Hi, my friends. All right, I went back to the table of contents and I figured it out. We are on chapter 16, Miss Honey's Cottage. Now it is a long chapter, so I will have to split it into two parts. So we'll finish part two on Monday. Miss Honey joined Matilda outside the school gates and the two of them walked in silence through the village high street. They passed the green grocer with his window full of apples and of apples and oranges and the small bank and the grocery store and the electrical shop. And then they came out on the other side of the village onto the narrow country road where there were no people anymore and very few cars. Now that they were alone, Matilda all of a sudden became wildly animated. It seemed as though a valve had burst inside her and a great gush of energy was being released. She trotted beside Miss Honey with wild little hops and her fingers flew as if she would scatter them to the four winds and her words went off like fireworks with terrific speed. It was Miss Honey this and Miss Honey that. And Miss Honey, I do honestly feel I could... I could move almost anything in the world, not just tipping over glasses and little things like that. I feel I could topple tables and chairs, Miss Honey. Even when people are sitting in them and the chairs, I think I could push them over. And bigger things too, much bigger things than chairs and tables. I only have to take a moment to get my eyes strong and then I can push it out. The strongness at anything at all, so long as I am staring at it hard enough. I have to stare at it very hard, Miss Honey, very, very hard. And then I can feel it all happening behind my eyes and my eyes get hot just as though they are burning. But I don't mind that in the least, Miss Honey. Whew, that's a lot of words, Matilda. She has a lot of energy. Oh, calm yourself down, child. Calm yourself down, Miss Honey said. Let us not get ourselves too worked up so early in the proceedings. But do you think it's interesting? Don't you, Miss Honey? Oh, it is interesting, all right, Miss Honey said. It is more than interesting, but we must tread very carefully from now on, Matilda. Why must we retread carefully, Miss Honey? Because we are playing with mysterious forces, my child, that we know nothing about. I do not think they are evil. They may be good. They may be even be divine. But whether they are or not, let us handle them carefully. These were wise words with a wise old bird, but Matilda was too steamed up to see it that way. I don't see why we have to be so careful, she said, still hopping about. I'm trying to explain to you, Miss Honey said patiently, that we are dealing with the unknown. It is an unexplainable thing. The right word for it is a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. Am I a phenomenon? Matilda asked. It is quite possible. That you are, Miss Honey said, but I'd rather you didn't think about yourself as anything in particular at that moment. What I thought we might do is to explore this phenomenon a little further, just the two of us together, but making sure we take things very carefully all the time. You want me to do some more of it then, Miss Honey? That is what I'm tempted to suggest, Miss Honey said cautiously. Good, good, Matilda said. I myself, Miss Honey said, am probably far more bowled over what you did than you are. And I'm trying to find some reasonable explanation. Such as what, Matilda asked. Such as whether or not it's got something to do with the fact that you are quite exceptionally precocious. What exactly does that word mean, Matilda said. A precocious child, Miss Honey said, is one that shows amazing intelligence early on. You are an unbelievably precocious child. Am I really? Matilda asked. Of course you are. You must be aware of that. Look at your reading. Look at your math. I suppose you're right, Matilda said. Miss Honey marveled at the child's lack of conceit and self-consciousness. I can't help wondering, she said, whether this sudden, sudden ability that has come to you of being able to move an object without touching it, whether it might not have something to do with your brain power. You mean there might be, there might not be room in my brain for all those, let me go back. You mean there might not be room in my head for all those brains so something has to push it out? That's not quite what I mean, Miss Honey said, smiling. But whatever happens, and I say it again, we must tread carefully from now on. I have not forgotten that strange and distant glimmer on your face after you tipped over the last glass. Do you think doing it could actually hurt me? Is that what you're thinking, Miss Honey? It made you feel pretty peculiar, didn't it? It made me feel lovely, Matilda said. For a moment or two, I was flying past the stars on silver wings. I told you that. And shall I tell you something else, Miss Honey? 
It was easier the second time, much, much easier. I think it's like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. Miss Honey was walking slowly so that the small child could keep up with her without trotting too fast, and it was very peaceful out there on the narrow road now that the village was behind them. It was one of those golden autumn afternoons, and there were blackberries and splashes of old man's beard in the hedges, and the hawthorn berries were ripening scarlet for the birds when the cold winter came along. There were tall trees here and there on either side, oak and sycamore and ash and occasionally a sweet chestnut. Miss Honey, wishing to change the subject for the moment, gave the names of all of these to Matilda and taught her how to recognize them by the shape of their leaves and the pattern of the bark on their trunks. Matilda took all of this in and stored the knowledge away, carefully in her mind. They came finally to a gap in the hedge on the left-hand side of the road where there was a five-barred gate. This way, Miss Honey said, and she opened the gate and led Matilda through and closed it again. They were now walking along a narrow lane that was no more than a rutted cart, cart track. There was a high hedge of hazel on either side, and you could see clusters of ripe brown nuts in their green jackets. The squirrels would be collecting them all very soon, Miss Honey said, and storing them away carefully for the bleak months ahead. You mean you live down here? Matilda asked. I do, Miss Honey replied, but she said no more. Matilda had never once stopped to think about where Miss Honey might be living. She had always regarded her, her purely as a teacher, a person who churned up out of nowhere and taught at school and then went away again. Do any of us children, she wondered, ever stop to ask ourselves where our teachers go when the school is over for the day? Do you guys think that about me? <laughs> Do we wonder if they live alone or if there is a mother at home or a sister or a husband? Do you live all by yourself, Miss Honey? She asked. Yes, Miss Honey, very much so. They were walking walking over the deep sun-baked mud tracks of the lane, and you had to watch where you put your feet if you didn't want to twist your ankle. There were a few small birds around in the hazel branches, but that's that was all. It's just a farm la laborer's cottage, Miss Honey said. You mustn't expect too much too much of it. We're nearly there. They came to a small green gate, half buried in the hedge and on the right and almost hidden by the overhanging hazel branches. Miss Honey paused with one hand on the gate and said, there it is. That's where I live. Here's them walking. Matilda saw a narrow dirt path leading to a tiny red brick cottage. The cottage was so small it looked more like a doll's house than a human dwelling. The bricks in the it was built of were old and crumbling and very pale red it had a gray slate roof and one small chimney and there were two little windows at the front each window was no larger than a sheet of tabloid newspaper and there was clearly no upstairs to the place on either side of the path there was a wilderness of nettles and blackberry thorns and long brown grass an enormous oak tree stood overshadowing the cottage its massive spreading branches seemed to be enfolding and embracing the tiny building and perhaps hiding it as well from the rest of the world miss honey with one hand on the gate which she had not yet opened turned to matilda and said a poet called Dylan Thomas once wrote some lines that I think of every time I walk up to this path. Matilda waited, and Miss Honey said in a rather wonderful small tone, Never and never, my girl, riding far and near, in the land of the hearthstone tales, and spelled asleep, fear or believe that the wolf in the sheep-white hood, loping and bleeding roughly and blithely, shall leap, my dear, my dear out of a lair in the flocked leaves in the dew dipped year to eat your heart in the house of the in the rosy wood there was a moment of silence and matilda who had never before heard great romantic poetry spoken aloud was profoundly moved it's like music she whispered all right my friends i will finish the chapter tomorrow this is a picture of miss honey's little cottage all right have a great weekend